Hello, everybody. The recording from Thursday's class did not have audio, which, given how it went, is probably a good thing. So I am going to be redoing what we covered in class on this video for those who are not there or for those who want to see it again. So we focused um, exclusively on example five. This is the same data that were featured in chapter five of my book, so if any of what I'm saying goes by too quickly, I would remind you that most of this is written out in chapter five as well. So we're just going to be introducing the idea of fixed and random effects of time, focusing on linear change in this example. We'll have multiple examples of nonlinear change in chapter six and example six. So we have, of course, a typo. <laughs> Funny how you see these things for the first time, even though you've looked at this handout a million times. First step is to tell SAS here, each program actually, where your stuff is. So there's that. I'm using the file save programming variable as a, an abbreviation for the, the path. So I'm reading in the data from chapter five and I am creating one new variable. So you will need to do this to complete your homework. You will need to center time such that the first occasion is time zero. So in this case, time is the new variable being created. Wave is the existing variable in this example data set that keeps track of which occasion is which. In your homework, it will be week instead of wave, but you will still need to compute a new variable and calling it time will probably make it easiest to follow this example. Likewise, we have the same code in Stata to define our path and I'm generating a new variable for time in Stata and doing the same thing in R and of course a much more roundabout way where I'm creating the new variable right here and I'm also uh, creating a new version of wave which is called wave 4 so that the last occasion can be denoted as the reference in the saturated means models. That is necessary to make the output match that of SAS, but it wouldn't be necessary otherwise. And as I noted before, I am having trouble getting R to cooperate, so if anybody out there can help me solve this problem identified here, I'm all ears. So in life, whenever possible, meaning that you have enough people, few enough occasions, and you have balanced data, it's helpful to get a sense of the lay of the land with respect to what the pattern of change over time looks like with respect to both the means model, so the average pattern of change, as well as the variance model, how the variances and covariances change over time as well. So we had talked about this uh, last week, I believe, on Tuesday, the idea of a saturated means unstructured R only variance model. So since we went over that one in my previous class, I'll go ahead and skip through this part and focus on what you will need to do for your homework, which is a saturated means random intercept model instead. So this model still has the advantage of treating time as a categorical variable. That way, each possible difference between occasions is estimated and we end up with as many fixed effects as we have occasions. So in SAS, for instance, wave four would be considered the reference. So I am fitting in a saturated means model, three slopes to create the four means when paired with the intercept. So four fixed effects, oh my goodness. More typos that I'm seeing before my very eyes. Four fixed effects for the for occasions. Now I have to go back and check the other equation and see if I fixed that one. That one's fixed. Okay. Well, who knows what I was thinking. Anywho, so I'm doing this just to get a sense of what the mean is at each occasion that I would then fit some sort of fixed and random slopes, fixed slopes through the means, random slopes um, to make the individual differences in those, in those trends. So wave is the version of the variable that is being used at this point. So person ID is the level two identifier that is called ID ver in your homework. Wave is the level one identifier. So we need wave on the class statement because it is used here in repeated. So wave is telling SAS how to structure the R matrix for each person, which occasions go into which rows and columns. And because wave is being treated as a categorical variable, when I put it on the model, 
what is actually happening under the hood is this specification right here. It is treating wave as a grouping variable and estimating the difference for each other wave relative to the reference wave, which is going to be the last occasion. Highest or last alphabetically is what happens in SAS, and it's a pain in the ass to change it, so I don't. And then I can ask for what the predicted mean is at each occasion using this Alice mean statement, as well as any pairwise differences. So that part isn't necessary for your homework, but you will end up with an F test that lumps together these three slopes, which is the omnibus effect of time in ANOVA language, which tells you whether or not there's any change over time on the whole. So in Stata, the same thing happens by using I dot wave. I dot means treated as categorical. Wave is still used in structuring the R matrix. And in R, I have two versions of the model. I have LME and I have LMER. I'm including the LME model simply so that I can get this part displayed, the predicted G, R, and V matrices for each of these models. Unfortunately, um, it does not use correct degrees of freedom for the fixed effects and on a consistent basis, let's put it that way. And so that's why I'm also using Elmer down here. Note that I have wave four as a factor variable here. Wave four is the version where the last occasion is the reference. That way the output matches SAS. And then the EM mean statement here is added to get us the F test for the overall differences across occasions, so the joint test of the three slopes. So this is a random intercept only model, which means there's only two parameters in the model for the variance. So we have level two random intercept variance, which is in the G matrix, and level one E residual variance, which is in the R matrix. So the rest of these matrices um, only serve to illustrate how these two numbers come together to form the overall, uh, the overall predicted marginal covariance matrix. So we have the total predicted variance on the diagonal from summing these two together, and then the off diagonal is given by the random intercept variance at level two. And this V matrix we can convert into a V correlation matrix. And so this is the ICC after controlling for mean differences over time. So then the model itself, the intercept is the expected mean at wave four, and each of these others, these are slopes, comparing each other wave to the reference wave four. So relative to reference wave four, the first wave is less by five, the second wave is less by three, and the third wave is less by about two. And so the joint test of all three of these slopes, these pairwise slopes relative to the reference wave, is given right here as the type three tests. So this is my joint F test uh, for the model in this case, since it's the only predictor, and it corresponds to what would be the omnibus main effect of time in ANOVA language. So this is something I will ask for on your homework as well. LS means then does the linear combinations of these fixed effects to create the predicted mean at each occasion. So then I've noted out here how those linear combinations get built. So for instance, the predicted mean at wave one starts with the predicted mean at wave four as the reference, and then subtracts five given the coefficient to get us to 10. So this shows more directly how the model predicts the mean at each occasion, and it looks like the means are increasing over time. Uh, it looks like they're increasing relatively linearly, so such that a, a linear slope would be a good fit. And then here's the pairwise mean differences. So when you don't have balanced data, the saturated means model is not going to be directly possible unless you round time. So rather than approaching it from what is the best possible model and working backwards, it often makes more sense to work forward starting from the most parsimonious, least complex model and then look at the contribution of adding terms. So from that perspective, the other baseline is the empty means random intercept model, or what is sometimes called unconditional means, meaning no predictors whatsoever. So the notation for the model is right here. At this point, we have y for each occasion for each person is a function of an individual intercept 
that individual intercept at level 2, beta 0i, gets broken down into what is a fixed intercept, the gamma 0, 0, and u0i, which is the random intercept deviation. So u0 is how far off each person's intercept is from the fixed intercept. Because there's no predictors in this model, the intercept is simply the mean over time. So when you put it together, gamma 0, 0 is the mean of the person means, u0i is how far off that person's mean is from the grand mean. You put them together to get to the person mean, and then from error, e is the deviation of the actual outcome of that occasion from the person's mean. So the utility of this model lies in being able to calculate an intraclass correlation that partitions the variance into how much of it is relative, is related to level two, the u0 variance, the random intercept, whose variance is going to be in g, and then how much of it is due to level, level one e residual variance, that variance is going to be in r. So at this point then, we still have our two ID variables, the level two person ID, level one wave, but there's no predictors in the model. So we have that blank space after the equal sign in the model statement. The random intercept is still in G. Type equals UN forever and ever amen on the random line because type equals UN refers to the structure of the G matrix specifically. At this point, it doesn't matter because we only have one random effect. But once you have a random slope in addition to the random intercept, it does matter and it's not a default. So we keep it that way on SAS code forever and ever. Repeated then refers to the structure of the R matrix. This is just going to be a diagonal matrix because of the type equals VC. That stands for variance components. This is the default. It's what you get even if you don't list a repeated statement in SAS. So the random intercept specification here in SAS corresponds to this part of the Stata code and corresponds to this part of the LME code and this part of the Elmer code. So all of those are ways of telling the program you want a random intercept. The one is used in R to make it explicit that it's a column of ones as the intercept. A random intercept is a default in Stata, so you don't have to write it. It is not a default in SAS, so you do have to write it as intercept. Then the R matrix. So the diagonal R matrix specified here in SAS is specified here in Stata as an independent structure as a function of wave. It is the default also in LME, so it's not included in that code, and it's the only option in LMER, so you don't have to worry about referring to it in either of those programs. And then last but not least, in Stata, you do have to provide a method for degrees of freedom calculation. That is only available when you have Remel estimation, by the way, so there's an instruction in your homework about what to do instead in Stata for the models in which I asked for ML. On that note, to make this model ML, I would remove the RE in SAS, I would remove the keyword REML in Stata, and then in, oh goodness, Elmer, I would change this true to false. The rest of this in Stata is asking for additional information, so to print the information criteria, the interclass correlation, and the various matrices. I was unable to get it to print R, by the way. It may be possible, but I haven't figured it out yet if so. I'm getting all of those things out of LME and R, and then last but not least, the function right here in Elmer is used to return minus two log likelihood instead of log likelihood. That way you save you a step in terms of the computation. So we have then in the model output from SAS here, the two parameters being estimated in our model UN11 refers to row 1, column 1 of the G matrix. It's the only thing in the G matrix, it's just one number. So 2.88 is the variance of the random intercepts at level 2. It's between person mean differences variance. Wave then, the 7, that is level 1 variance of the E residuals at a given occasion. And that variance lives in the R matrix. So the rest of this just serves to illustrate how these two parameters work together to form the overall marginal predicted variance and covariances across time. 
marginal meaning put back together again. So if we have the R matrix here, so this is the variance at each occasion of the E level one within person residuals. So this model predicts it to stay constant over time and it predicts that the E level one residuals have no covariance. That's what the blank spaces in here mean. So this is what's known as a diagonal structure or an independent structure. Then we have our G matrix, which is just one number at this point, which is why I said the type doesn't really matter because there is no structure here. And if I take this 2.88 and add it to every single spot in this R matrix, then we end up with our predicted V. So V is the marginal put back together again, variance covariance matrix across occasions. So 9.9 .9 is the predicted variance from this model at the first occasion and at the second occasion and at the third occasion and at the fourth occasion. Likewise, the predicted covariance between any pair of occasions is the same over time and it is a function directly of the random intercept variance. So if you convert this variance covariance matrix to a correlation matrix by translating all of the variances into standardized ones, we end up with vcor. And so this is the correlation matrix that provides the intra-class correlation. So 29% of the total variance that's given on the diagonal is due to the random intercept. So it's 29% level two between person random intercept person mean differences. And the remaining 71% is level one within person E residual variance over time. This is the one instance in which the output that's given here by default, it's also given and stated by default, the null model likelihood ratio test. This is a minus two log likelihood difference of this empty model if I had removed the random intercept. So if I had removed this random intercept, the minus two log likelihood would have increased by 9.79. So this is the difference in minus two log likelihood and it is significant. So what this is telling us is that the model fits significantly better. Minus two log likelihood is lower by having this random intercept variance in the model. So really that's speaking to the need for the off diagonal here to not be zero. Said differently, this intraclass correlation, in, intraclass correlation, yes, is an effect size for the significance test of the level two random intercept variance. So it is significantly greater than zero. It is 0.29 in a correlation me metric. So yes, we would need the random intercept. The other parameter that's being estimated right here is gamma zero zero, that's my fixed intercept. This is the mean of the person means because at this point, time is not yet in the model. So this empty means model predicts no change over time of any kind. We then want to add a fixed linear effect of time. So in terms of a schematic, the model that we just finished, empty means, is this top left picture. No fixed effect of time, no random effect of time. It predicts parallel flat lines over time. Now we're going to move to this one, a model that allows a fixed linear time slope, so change on average in a linear form but still constrains the change to be parallel across people. So people have a random intercept still, a difference in the y-axis, they all share the same slope. Oh, come back, there we go. So then in the equation, we've picked up a new beta one i. So each person has the potential, according to this notation, to have their own linear time slope. Time is a level one predictor, so it gets both a T and an I to show that it varies over time in persons. But then beta one at level two is defined only by a fixed effect, a fixed slope gamma one O. So to put this into composite notation, the first term here is the intercept. Each person gets their own intercept because they have a fixed effect on average paired with an individual specific U zero deviation. And then each person shares a common fixed slope. So this is a constant slope for everybody here. 
And because time is now a predictor, the intercept is no longer the person mean over time. Instead, it is the predicted intercept conditionally at time equals zero, which was defined as wave one, given the way that time is created. So this is the first model in which we have in the SAS code two different variables referring to time. We need both of them because they serve different purposes. So wave is still on the class statement because it's still on the repeated statement as an ID variable. Wave is being treated as a categorical ID variable used to structure the R matrix to tell SAS which row and column to put a given observation in. That's important if you have missing data for any of the waves. In the model, we have time instead. So time was created as wave minus one, such that wave one is time zero. It has to be a different variable than what is included on the class statement and on the repeated. Wave is categorical, time is quantitative. So it is going to result in one fixed slope being estimated across time in this model. So it's not saturated means anymore, it's just one fixed slope, not three mean differences. And this time variable then goes into these estimate statements. Estimate statements create linear combinations of your fixed effects to show model implied results, such as what the model predicts the mean to be at each occasion from the line being drawn through this fixed linear time model. So time zero at week one, is already given as the model intercept, but I include it here for completeness. The remaining three statements are going to yield the predicted outcome at the other occasions according to the model. In SAS, I have also used this ODS output statement to save uh, these two tables, the covariance parameters and the fit statistics for use in my macros that uh, will do calculations for pseudo R square as well as for um, uh, a comparison of model fit likelihood ratio test, which is coming in just a moment. Okay, so in Stata, I don't think Stata is as picky about this as SAS, but I made the code look the same so that it would be uh, directly parallel. I've introduced c.time as a quantitative predictor, so just a fixed effect. Still only have a random intercept because there's nothing in here, and the rest of this is as it was before. In Stata, we have Lincom as the analog to the estimate statements. The small means use the degrees of freedom method that was used in estimating the model. Cons is the fixed intercept, and then in Stata, the multiplication of each variable, which is actually the beta, times the value for the variable that you want the result for is shown explicitly as well as the explicit addition as a linear combination. So these estimate statements here map onto these lincom statements here. It is possible in Stata to do this via margins, but I didn't do that so that the code would stay the same across different programs. In our code, we have picked up plus time right there as a fixed effect in the LME and as a fixed effect in the LMER as well. So then after including a fixed effect of time, the R matrix here, remember this is the variance of the level one E residuals at each occasion. It used to be 7.06 and now it's down to 2.17. In other words, about 69% of all the reasons why people were deviating around their person means is because of an average effect of time across persons. So by drawing a, um, a non-flat line for each person, the same line, but just allowing it to be not flat, we've reduced what we were calling level one within person variance by 69%. Because of that reduction though, the random intercept variance at level two in the G matrix increased. So this is a necessary outcome. Whenever residual variance at level one is reduced, random intercept variance at level two will increase. 
because random intercept variance at level two is adjusted by an expected correction factor for the variance at level one divided by sample size. So that there's less of a correction after the residual variance at level one is reduced. So random intercept goes up, but it's an expected consequence. And that's given by this formula right here. So the V matrix then, the marginal covariance matrix across time, if I take this random intercept variance and add it to every spot in R, that gets me to V. So the total variance at any occasion is about 2.6.27 according to this model. The covariance in total at any occasion, pair of occasions, is given by the random intercept variance, and I can convert that into a correlation of 0.65. So after controlling for time, the expected correlation of occasions from the same person is actually higher than what it was before. And in terms of the new fixed effect, right here is where it is. The good news is that we don't have to do anything fancy to determine whether or not it's significant. We can just stare at the p-value that shows up. And I have a question out here. Could we have used minus two log likelihood to judge whether or not this new term, the fixed linear time slope, helped the model? The answer is no, because we are using Remmel. So when you are comparing models estimated in Remmel, the means part, the fixed effects, have to stay the same. Because Remmel operates on the model residuals, and the model residuals are defined differently if you have different fixed effects. So they're not on the same scale, and it's like, apples and oranges. So for all fixed effects, regardless of how they're being estimated, whether it's ML or REML, we can just stare at the p-value that shows up on the output. So I refer to this as a walled test, although in this case it's a walled test that uses a T instead of a Z, because we're using Satterthwaite denominator degrees of freedom. Now these look sort of strange. For instance, you're unlikely to see degrees of freedom with decimal values, but that is uh, a regular occurrence for Satterthwaite. Uh, Satterthwaite degrees of freedom originated, from what I understand, in the context of a dependent samples t-test where there, there were different sized groups uh, and different variances as well. So that idea of needing to control for the amount of variability and sample size is the basis of Satterthwaite. So it's, these degrees of freedom reflect not only the level at which the variable is measured, but also its relative amounts of variance in, in each predictor as well as with respect to the outcome. So you will see these degrees of freedom look kind of funny. It's not something that typically get reported in tables. So you might mention in your method section overall that you used Satterthwaite denominator degrees of freedom, but then in terms of what would be reported, you would report the estimate column, the standard error column, and then either a p-value column or a set of stars denoting you know, your levels of significance. So our new fixed slope right here, gamma 1.0, as I note, was estimated at 1.7. So a slope is still the same slope that it's always been. A slope is the difference in y for a one unit difference in x. So that means that our outcome variable is predicted to increase by 1.7 for every additional unit of time, or which is wave here. The slope has a standard error that describes its expected inconsistency across samples. More specifically, the standard error of a slope is how far off on average the slope from any one sample would be from the population version of the slope. And if I take this estimate, divide it by the standard error, then I end up with this t value. So t is a test statistic that standardizes this result so that the mean is the null hypothesis and the standard deviation is the standard error. So what this is telling us is that our slope of 1.7 is about 13 standard errors away from the null hypothesis of zero, which of course translates into a probability of much less than 5%. So we would call this a significant slope which means, yes, people are increasing on average. And then the result of the slope in terms of what it predicts for the intercept at each occasion. So I call these intercepts because eventually they will be conditional on other things. 
but in this example, these you can think of these as just means of each occasion. This is what the model predicts the mean to be. And I have noted out here how the linear combination operates. So 10.27 is the intercept at time zero as defined by the model. If I take 10.27 and add 1.7 to it, I get to the predicted outcome at time one. Add another 1.7, I get to this one. Do it again and I get to this one. So the linear slope implies a constant change over time in the outcome as a function of time. And then this is the output from a little macro program that I wrote that calculates pseudo r square, which is the proportion reduction in each variance component. So I have the results from the empty means random intercept model, and then added to that are the results from the fixed linear time slope random intercept model. And so it computes the proportion reduction in each variance component. So this is where I got the number shown earlier that the level one residual variance was seven. It went down to two something, which is a reduction of about 70%, which in turn increased the level two random intercept variance. So that shows up as a negative pseudo R square for that component. So back to the pictures then. We just finished with this one on the top right. Now we're moving down to the bottom right. So we have a significant fixed effect of time on average. The question is, does that fixed effect need to be allowed to differ across persons? Does the fixed time slope need to also have a random effect that creates an individual time slope that it differs from across persons? So it differs from the fixed effect as what happens on average. So to do that, we have our random linear time model. So note the change in terminology. We still have a fixed linear effect of time, but we have added a random effect. And so because random effects are phrased as deviations from fixed effects, the fixed effects are presumed to still be there. So we can just talk about having a random slope, which implies we also have a fixed slope. So the fixed time slope that we had in the model stays there. We bring in a random time slope. So we're adding the quantitative predictor for time onto the random line. So in general, the quantitative version of time goes into these two lines right here. The categorical ID version of time, which is wave, goes into class and goes into repeated. So these are two different variables because they serve two different purposes. And if you get them confused, something will go wrong with your model. Your stats will yell at you, one of the two. So in terms of the equation, this beta one I creating each person's individual time slope has now picked up a U one I random slope. So U one I is the deviation for each individual from the fixed slope given by gamma one O. So if I'm somebody who grows faster than other people, my U one I would be positive. If I grow at a slower rate than other people, my U one I would be negative. And so that is shown in composite form down here, where the effect of time is partly what is in common, the fixed effect of time, and partly what is individual, the random effect of time. And we still have the same predicted outcome at each occasion because the model for the means, the fixed effects, has not changed. Uh, I am going to ask it to do a likelihood ratio test to examine whether or not adding this random time slope significantly improved the model. And this is the point where type equals UN matters. So now that we have two random effects in the model, we need to make sure that we have type equals UN on the random line, which refers to the G matrix at level two being unstructured. In other words, we are telling SAS to let the random intercept variance be estimated as whatever it wants, the random linear time slope variance to be estimated as whatever it wants, and that the random intercepts and the random linear time slopes have a covariance. So the slope and the intercept for the same person get to be related. That is not a default. So that idea of letting the G matrix be unstructured also shows up in Stata as this option, covariance unstructured, which is necessary because time is now included as a random effect 
So the intercept is implicit in Stata. Time has to be added to allow individual differences in the effect of time, which means we have to have this covariance unstructured. Um, as near as I can tell, random effects are automatically allowed a covariance in R. Um, I don't know how to shut it off, to be honest. I'll probably learn that at some point. Um, so we just have to add plus time in the random section here of L and E, or plus time in the random section given by L M E R. And I'm doing a likelihood ratio test against the fixed slope version of the model using R ANOVA, I had found, using LR test and STATA. So we're comparing the previous model that had fixed intercept and fixed linear slopes and just a random intercept to this new model that has the same fixed effects and adds the random linear slope and its covariance. So now we have four parameters estimated in the model for the variance. The first three refer to the G matrix at level two. So UN11, the estimate of 2.2, that's my variance across persons in the random intercept. At this point, it is no longer the variance across the person means because of the random time slope. So 2.2 is the variance across persons in the intercepts specifically, conditionally, at time equals zero. Next in the list, UN21, that is the covariance between the random intercept and the random linear time slope. More general, when you look at these UN things, if it's the same number in both places for the row and the column, that's some kind of variance. Like 1, 1 is a random intercept variance, 2, 2 is the random slope variance. If it's two different numbers, then it's some kind of covariance instead. So 0 0.05 is the covariance between the intercepts and the slopes. It's hard to interpret a covariance, and so I can ask for that same number as a correlation. So G core, for instance, is right there. So the covariance shows up in G, the correlation shows up in G core. So it looks like the intercepts and linear time slopes are slightly positively related. So if I start out higher than other people at time zero, I'm very slightly likely to be someone who grows faster than other people as well. And then last but not least, wave right here. This is the remaining residual variance at level one at each occasion. And that has been reduced because part of what we were calling level one E residual variance has been moved into a new pile. So we have partitioned level one residual variance into what is still level one and what is actually level two in the random linear time slopes. In other words, E variance is why are you off your line? In the previous model, everybody's line had the same slope. If we allow each person to have a different slope, then you should be off your line less as a whole because your line fits better. So the E variance has been reduced, and I don't think it's proper to say that it's been explained though, because this random new time slope that is a new pile of variance is still error variance in the sense that we don't know why some people grow faster than others. So it's still unexplained, we just know that it is systematic to the effect of time varying across persons. So these four numbers then are the ingredients that together create the predicted variances and covariances over time. So here's the R matrix. That is the level one variance of the E residuals at each occasion. We are still saying that it's constant over time and that the E's are unrelated. Now we have a G matrix that's two by two. So what we have added to the model is the covariance between the intercepts and the slopes and the variance of the random linear time slopes. So two degrees of freedom new relative to the previous model. And in this case, it's not obvious how the V matrix gets formed because G and R are missing one other matrix that is needed to make G the right size to be added to R. I haven't shown you that, but I'm going to. But I wanted to make the point, though, that what ends up happening under the hood is that we have a way of creating a pattern. So in the same way that you have compound symmetry as a pattern, unstructured as a pattern, 
AR1, topolates, random intercept plus AR1 or topolates. Those are all patterns of what the variances and covariances can look like over time. The job of random intercepts and time slopes is to create a pattern. And you'll note that this says this is the V matrix for person one. That's because the pattern that is predicted depends on which values of time a person has. It's a customized pattern that can interpolate between possible time values. So that way, if we have unbalanced time, each person gets their own custom G matrix that takes into account their time values. So I'll show you uh, how that works next week, but I just want you to have the idea in your head that what random effects do is create a pattern. And the pattern is that variances are predicted to increase over time. That is the result of adding the random linear time slope. It says that people spread themselves out over time and that covariance is predicted to change over time as well, such that the predicted correlation between occasions is reduced as the occasions go further and further away. Then we have our two fixed effects. Note that the degrees of freedom for them now match because both of them are random. So they're both uh, have degrees of freedom for their denominator that are reasonably close to sample size, which is 25 in this case. Um, if you compare the standard errors, you'll notice that the standard error for the linear time slope is bigger now. It's 0.2 relative to the previous model in which it was 0.13. That's because the random slope variance goes into the standard error specifically which is why it's important to make sure that you have all random effects related to time so that the fixed effect of time has the right standard error as does any other interaction with time that will eventually go into the model. And in order to know whether or not our random time slope is significant, you are not allowed to stare at the p-value that shows up here. We are not allowed to use walled tests for variances because variances don't have a normal sampling distribution. Uh, if you have enough people and the variance is large enough, it does, but that's not guaranteed. So the more correct way to test whether or not a variance is helpful to the model is to do a likelihood ratio test to a nested model that does not have that variance in it. So we have this little piece of output comes from my fit test macro. The fit of the model that had a random intercept only versus the model we're currently looking at that added a random linear time slope. Note the number of parameters refers to just the parameters in the model for the variance because we're using Remmel estimation. So we had random intercept and residual variances as the two, and we've added random linear time slope variance and its covariance with the intercept at level two as the extra two parameters here. The addition of those two parameters lowered the minus two log likelihood, so the difference in the deviance, as I have it labeled here, are 48. So the model that has a lower minus two log likelihood fits better. So the difference is 48 on two degrees of freedom gives me a p-value that requires scientific notation. So yes, definitely a significant addition to the model. And where we ended up in class is me saying, use these formula to calculate effect sizes for the random variances, and we'll talk more about what they mean conceptually in class next week. And I wanna point out that I included as part of the example five download folder, the zip folder that has all the original data syntax and output. There's an Excel spreadsheet in there that has each of these formula, these programmed into one of the pages. So there's a page for random effects confidence intervals, and there's a page for these reliability estimates. I had a question in office hours what, as to what this term is right here. That is the variance of the predictor that has the random slope. So what would be the variance of the time predictor in our example, which you would have to get uh, via a separate piece of output. So running uh, summarize or proc means or something like that. So in this example, I had previously found it to be 1.26. So that is included in the syntax in the example download files so that you can get that number to use in this formula. 
So these are ways of trying to convey just how big a variance is in a more intuitive way, since we can't calculate our squares for variances, or they don't make sense to, let's put it that way. We'll talk more about that later as well. So that is where we ended up. Hopefully this will be a little bit clearer after going back over this, and I would recommend reading chapter five as well, because this idea of adding fixed and random effects is something that we're going to continue working with throughout the semester, especially for level one predictors. Level one predictors such as time can have fixed effects and random effects. So we will have more fun with that next time. So thank you for joining me. Hope to see you next week. Take care.